Is this working? I don't know if it's working. I can't hear it. Can't hear it. Let's make sure. I think sometimes it picks the wrong mic. Testing, testing. Good morning, John. No, this is not the right microphone. Testing, 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 testing. All right, there we go. So, good morning. How's it going, everybody? Uh, today we're going to be doing a stream on a paper called Self-Alignment with Instruction Back Translation. So this feels like it's an old paper at this point, and it's kind of crazy that a paper that is basically <laughs> less than a month old is considered old. But that's the uh, dizzying pace of machine learning in 2023. So self-alignment is uh, the alignment of a model with itself, right? Aligning by itself, kind of like self-supervision, you know? There's supervised learning and then self-supervised learning, and I guess there's alignment and now there's self-alignment. Uh, instruction back translation is also a completely new term that is being introduced by this paper. So this paper is doing new things. Uh, work coming out of Meta AI. We present a scalable method to build a high quality instruction following language model. So I think instruction following is probably just a chat model. I'm not exactly sure if that's like the more formal way to describe chat models in those circles. How's it going, uh, Christopher? By automatically labeling human written text with corresponding instructions. So labeling usually is adding additional metadata to some specific piece of data, right? In a computer vision contest that context, that might be something like a bounding box or a segmentation mask. But I don't know what labeling for the purpose of instruction following is. So we'll see what happens. Our approach named instruction back translation starts with a language model fine-tuned on a small amount of seed data. So seed data just refers to the smallness and the initial amount. Fine-tuned, probably fine-tuned the entire model and not just like a LoRa or some kind of small additional module. The seed model is used to construct training examples by generating instruction prompts for web documents. Okay, so basically self-augmentation. That's a new terminology as well, right? Data augmentation is when you take a data point and turn it into more data points by changing little parts of it. So augmentation, I think it's easier to understand it. Uh, augmentation image data. Yeah, data augmentation. So when you're training these computer vision models, you'll train it on this image and then maybe you crop it and then maybe you uh, change this is a weird looking let me go back let me find a better picture this this is data augmentation so you take the same picture of the cat and then you basically rotate it crop it shift it translate it and it's still a picture of a cat right so you've gone from having one data point of this is a cat to having now nine data points of these are all cats so you've augmented your data so when they're talking about self augmentation here they're basically using a language model to take some specific web document and then augment it maybe add sentences remove sentences change some of the words uh, so that it still has the same label we don't really know what the label is maybe the label is high quality low quality good sentiment bad sentiment or something like that and then it augments it in such a way that the label is maintained. Selecting high quality examples amongst these candidates, self-curation. OK, 
Okay, so a little bit of data set cleaning. Normally this curation is done manually and at great cost. It's extremely annoying and uh, soul crushing to do data set curation, but it's actually one of the things that works well and works good no matter what your application is. So if LLMs can do their own data set curation, that would be really great. This data is then used to fine tune a stronger model. Fine tuning Llama on two iterations of our approach yields a model that outperforms all other Llama based models on the Alpaca leaderboard. So obviously this is a meta AI paper, so it's going to be based on Llama, which is their open source model. They are currently on Llama 2, which was released relatively recent ago and people have already been uh, kind of fine-tuning these llama models and uh, I think alpaca may leaderboard probably comes from the Vicuña benchmark let me make sure the alpaca leaderboard so these leaderboards they basically create these like uh, games and then they have these AIs fight each other and then it's obviously like a, a text game right and the game is basically who can answer the question the best and these are a little sketchy because the way that they evaluate these is actually with another LLM so they they basically ask the same question to two LLMs and then they ask a third LLM to say which of these two LLMs did a better job answering that question and so on and as you can see GPT-4 is kind of the best right now uh, the Llama 2 chat 70B so this is the second version of Llama and the 70B refers to the size, so this is the biggest version of Llama. You can't even run this at home unless you have a monster GPU. Most of the Llama 2 stuff that you see is usually this one here, this 13B, which you can see it's kind of lower in the in the benchmark or in the in the baseline here. But uh, I don't even see it here anymore. Here, actually, here we go. Vicuña 33B. So this model here is interesting because this is a fine-tuned Llama 1. So Vicuña, they took a Llama 1 model uh, and then they fine-tuned it on responses from GPT. Or another way to think about it is they fine-tuned it on synthetically created data from GPT and, or ChatGPT. So you can take a model that is all the way down here. If we look at the original Llama 33B, it's probably somewhere all the way down here and then they fine-tuned it to be particularly good at these uh, leaderboards. But again, <laughs> caution, GPT-4 may favor models with longer outputs and or those that were fine-tuned on GPT-4 outputs. Because you're evaluating these models with GPT-4, GPT-4 has kind of like a preference for the output of models that are fine-tuned on its own data. Uh, okay. But here they're going to be fine-tuning a Llama 2 model on some data that is generated from another Llama model. And they're going to show that it uh, does quite well on this leaderboard. Uh, not relying on distillation data, demonstrating highly effective self-alignment. So distillation data. What they're calling, what they're talking about here is, uh, there's different types of distillation. There's model distillation and dataset distillation. So, dataset distilla distillation is just an English word that is distilling. Basically, means taking a large volume of thing and then turning it into a more concentrated small volume of a thing. So, the most obvious example of distillation is alcohol. People distill alcohol from this kind of like soup, which I think is called a mash kind of like a beer and then they distill it down to like a spirit right like something like a vodka and you can do that same kind of concept with a model you can take a model that's very big and then kind of distill a smaller model from it where you basically take a small model and then train it to kind of mimic the bigger model and then in a sense you've distilled the big model into a small model it's not going to be quite as good as the big model but it'll kind of pretend to be the big model and uh, Vicuña 33B is a distilled GPT-4. So it kind of thinks it's a GPT-4, but really it's a Llama 2. But you can also do dataset distillation. And dataset distillation is the idea of, okay, I have a whole dataset. Can I distill this down into a concentrated dataset that will get me to the same place if I basically uh, feed this into some model? It'll, it'll get me to the same final set of weights 
maybe not perfectly, but it'll get me to the same place with a much smaller total size. I think the data set distillation paper is quite ancient at this point. Yeah, 2018. So uh, people have been thinking about this for a while. He, data set distillation in 2018 is a completely different mindset, different idea, different uh, different paradigm than data set distillation in 2023. In 2023, when, when they're talking about data set distillation, they're almost talking, it's going to be some kind of weird setup like this where you have LLMs generating output for other LLMs. Okay, so that's what this paper's about. Now let's go into it. Uh, GGG, good evening. Hello. Hello, Scott. Hello, Eugene. Aligning large language models to perform instruction following, aka to chat with you, typically requires fine-tuning on a large amounts of human annotated instructions or preferences. This is the kind of RLHF type stuff that uh, OpenAI kind of became famous for, right? It's They got a bunch of this human annotated instruction data and then they fine-tuned on that and that's how they turned something generic like a GPT-4 which just when it's finished with its next token pre-training all it does is it really it just completes the text that is in front of it but in order to turn it into this kind of chatbot that kind of gleefully answers you and, and tries to tries to answer your questions and it's like trying to be helpful helpfulness or whatever they call it you have to do some amount of fine-tuning whether that's with RLHF whether that's actually just directly pushing gradients into the model uh, generally from these human annotated instructions uh, distilling outputs from more powerful models this is the model distillation that I'm referring to uh, recent works highlight the importance of human annotation data quality Data quality has always been a huge issue, so uh, I don't know if uh, you need, uh, I don't know if that's a recent thing. Anybody who's worked in ML knows that the quality of your data is huge and data quality issues are 80% of what you do. Annotating instruction following data sets with such quality is hard to scale. Uh, hard to scale if you're do using humans, but if you're using language models, it's really easy to scale. So you can see how they're setting up this uh, this conclusion that they're going to come to at the end of this introduction. In this work, we leverage large amounts of unlabeled data, so raw data, data that has no specific target, right? Supervised learning requires labeled data. Unsupervised learning uses unlabeled data. To create a high-quality instruction tuning data set by developing an iterative self-training algorithm. Uh, this is not novel either. We've seen this over and over again. We saw in the segment anything model, which was a computer vision model that does segmentation, uh, had a similar strategy where basically it you they use the model to label about some unlabeled data, then train on that labeled unlabeled data, and then iteratively kind of refine its own outputs and then train on its own outputs. So makes sense that you could basically do the same thing with a language model. The method uses the model itself to both augment and curate high quality training examples. So again, very similar to the segment anything training approach. Our approach named instruction back translation. So here's where they drop the uh, title of the paper. And this is new terminology here is inspired by the classic back translation method for machine translation. Okay, so actually this comes from an even older <laughs> uh, type of natural language method, I guess, back translation in which human written target sentences are automatically annotated with model generated source sentences in another language. Uh, so as I was sitting here saying that, hey, people have been doing this in computer vision for years, they, they kind of pulled a trump card on my trump card and said, hey, well, people have been doing this in natural language processing for even longer. So I don't know. There you go. Maybe it just got owned. Our method starts with a seed instruction following model and a web corpus. The model is first used to self-augment its training set. So it doesn't generate new examples, it'll just augment its current examples, right? So augmentation, just think this, right? It's just taking its text and then just kind of maybe changing words or adding extra stuff. For each web document, it creates an instruction following training example by predicting a prompt that would be correctly answered by a portion of such document. Okay, 
predicting a prompt that would be correctly answered by. So it's basically creating a fake prompt. So it maybe it goes through Wikipedia and it gets and it goes through like the I don't know the Wiki, Wikipedia page on France or something like that. And then it'll come here and it'll say, okay, well here's a section on the French Revolution of 19, 1789. So it'll take this, it'll copy paste this, and it'll create a prompt that said, tell me more about the French Revolution. And then this will be the answer. So in a sense, it's creating its own instruction data, pretending that someone asked a specific question that it happens to have the answer to. Directly training on such data gives poor results in our experiments, both because of the mixed quality of the human written web text and the noise in the generated instructions. To remedy this, we show that the same seed model can be used to self-curate the set of newly created augmentation data by predicting their quality. So you can just ask the model itself whether the data that it augmented is garbage or not, which is <laughs> the magic of LLMs. Every, every problem with LLMs can just be answered or solved with another LLM is apparently the new paradigm that can be self-trained not only on the highest quality instruction output pairs, this is the uh, raw data, I guess, and then the label. The procedure is then iterated using the improved model to better curate the instruction data and then retraining to produce a better model. So you know that part in the, uh, in the dystopian sci-fi movies where the AI uh, tr makes a better version of itself and tr and like rewrites its own code. This is this is exactly that. <laughs> this is the model generating better data to then make itself better and then once it is better it can generate better data to then train itself better to then generate more data to train itself better and it's I don't know at some point what is it generating, right? I'd love to see this uh kind of taken to the limit and and once you take it to the limit what what data is that model train generating right that would be super interesting to see if it kind of converges to this weird point that we can't even predict right at some point maybe it realizes that english is actually an inferior language and that there's this obvious much better language and it starts creating training data in some weird new language that we can't even understand as a human and it, that's the path to uh, agi is an llm on some weird alien language that is a much better uh, semantic compression of our current four-dimensional space-time. But back to this paper, our resulting model humpback, okay, so they've run out of uh, camel-based species, uh, vicuña, camel, llama, I guess now they're going into the uh, mammals of the sea. So humpback is going to be the name for this one. Outperforms all other existing non-distilled models on the alpaca leaderboard. Overall, instruction back translation is a scalable method for enabling language models to improve their own ability to follow instructions. Pretty good. Here we go. Nice little figure one here. I feel like they could have picked better colors and like the formatting here is a little weird. The overlapped is, is kind of fucked up, but all right. An overview of our instruction back translation method. We start from a base language model, e.g. llama. Okay, so you start with this llama model here. Uh, a small amount of seed examples, instruction output pairs. So I guess these are created manually. So you start with some seed of manually created instruction output pairs and a collection of unlabeled documents which are considered candidate outputs for unknown instructions. So here's your unlabeled data, just like a, a web crawl, you know, common crawl or something like that. Big giant dump of data. Uh, you start with your seed data, which is your curated human uh, data. That gets fed into, I guess, MYX here, which is based on the llama, I guess. Yeah, so I guess you got llama and then MYX and then M0, M1, M2, so you can see how it's kind of like iteratively creating a better version of itself. And supposedly M2 would be better than M1, which would be better than M0 on this benchmark of instruction following. The base model is fine-tuned with output instruction pairs as the instruction prediction model, which is used to generate candidate instructions for outputs from the unlabeled data. Okay, so the 
MYX model, which they're calling the uh, instruction prediction model. We're going to label that in green. Green is the color we use for uh, mathematical definitions. So here, I guess if we're going to assign the variable MYX to this, we're going to highlight it in green. But you can see how it's using the seed data and the unlabeled data to create this augmented data, A, which is X hat I, Y, I. So in a, a supervised learning context, generally the input is X, and then the target, or what you're trying to predict, is Y, right? So if you were doing a bounding box prediction model, the input would be the image X, and then the output would be the bounding box. Uh, if you were doing sentiment analysis, the input would be the review, right? Maybe like a movie review X, and then the output Y would be uh, the sentiment, which is is it positive, negative, somewhere in between, and so on. So here you're creating uh, new data sets, right? So basically x hat i, the x hat probably refers to the fact that it's, it's augmented. Uh, all right, and then you take this augmented data, and it looks like you basically just train on it, and you get to the next one. You train on it, and you get to the next one. And then you just rinse, repeat is used to generate candidate instructions. Starting from an intermediate instruction following model M0, fine-tuned from seed examples only. Okay, so this first model M0 is only fine-tuned on the seed data. So M0 is a llama model that is fine-tuned on human curated uh, data, and then you augment it. And this is exactly the segment anything model, basically. In the segment anything model, the very first segmentation model that they train is fine-tuned on or is not fine-tuned, in that case it's trained directly on a curated segmentation data such as COCO or something like that. But then once you have this uh, segmentation model that's pretty good because it's been trained on the curated, human-created data set like COCO, then you can use it to label a bunch of other images and then now you can start training on those images too. And, and then you kind of repeat this virtuous cycle and eventually get to a model that has self trained on basically every single image on the internet. Selects high quality output pairs, AKI, from the candidate from the previous step and uses them as fine tuning data for the next intermediate model M1, which in turn is used to select training data for obtaining M2. And there we go. Uh, method, nice. So they don't go to the, I love the, I love it when they go straight to method and they skip the, the related work. I'm generally against related work section for many reasons. Our self-training approach assumes access to a base language model, a small amount of seed data, a collection of unlabeled examples, e.g. a web corpus. So base language model, I think pretty much everyone has access to that. A small amount of seed data, I would say you could create this at home pretty easily. If you use an LLM, you can create it even faster. And then collection of unlabeled examples, e.g. a web corpus, you kind of also have access to this too, right? You have a common crawl. Common crawl is a kind of an open source. I don't know if it's actually open source, but basically it's a big giant uh, data set of every single, hopefully the entire internet, but it's not quite the entire internet. Uh, I guess one thing they don't mention here is that you need to have a huge amount of compute. They kind of conveniently leave that part out. Uh, you need all of these things, but you also need a huge amount of compute and time to run this. Uh, and that's the piece that you don't have. So as a person in your house, you, you kind of have access to the data and you have access to the base language model and you can create these uh, seed data. But what you don't have is a huge amount of GPUs and money to burn on this problem. The unlabeled data is a large, diverse set of human written documents, which includes writing about all manners of topics humans are interested in, but crucially is not paired with instructions. The first key assumption is that there exists some subset of this very large human written text that would be suitable as gold generations for some user instructions. <laughs> I don't know what gold generations, I don't know if that has a specific definition. I guess they just mean good generations. I don't know why they chose the word gold there. A second key assumption is that we can predict instructions for these candidate gold answers that can be used as high quality example pairs to train an instruction following model. So the process consists of these two core steps of augmenting, so generating instructions, 
from these unlabeled data, right? Basically taking that unlabeled data, this unlabeled Wikipedia page, and then turning it into a bunch of question answers, which you can then train on, right? Uh, such as what is the name of the of the old? Uh, where does the term Frank come from? And then you could say, oh, here's where it comes from, right? So you're kind of like creating these like fake questions to then basically end up with a, a huge corpus of training data that is in this specific instruction output pair format. Uh, okay, so you're creating uh, these pairs and then you're curating these pairs. Self-select high quality demonstrations to fine tune the base models. This approach is done iteratively where a better intermediate can improve on selecting data for fine tuning in the next iteration. Cool, so let's see, what do we start with? We start with the seed data. Seed set of human annotated instruction output examples that will be used to fine tune language models to give initial predictions in both directions. I think the choice of the word seed here is also not by accident. So for example, in reinforcement learning, you have to any kind of random behavior is controlled by a, a random seed. A random seed determines what the random number generator in your computer does, right? So in reinforcement learning, you will often start by choosing a seed. And one of the weird non-intuitive things is that if you pick different seeds, you get different kind of ending points. So you might take the same exact reinforcement learning algorithm trained in the same environment on basically the same data, but one starts with one seed and a different one starts with a different seed and the one with the different seed works and the one with the one seed doesn't work, right? And it's a little bit weird, but it's like, that's just the way it works. So the choice of the word seed here probably has a similar, it's, it's, it's kind of forcing you to make a similar intuitive understanding of what this seed data is really doing. What this seed data is really doing is it's kind of pu pushing the model in this speci in one specific direction, right? So it's like you're kind of like pushing the boat in that direction and then all of this self iteration and refinement is going to be in that direction and sometimes that's going to lead to nonsense and sometimes that's going to lead to something good. So by using the word seed here they're kind of making it sound like the seed matters. Right, and you just small changes in the seed will result in drastically different uh, models. But I don't know. I'm just kind of conjecturing here. Prediction an output given an instruction, and an instruction given an output. We use a web corpus as a source of unlabeled data. We perform pre-processing to extract self-containing segments (YI). Okay, so maybe paragraphs, I guess, which are portions of text following an HTML header. HTML is the uh, what is used to render web pages. So if you just go and hit F11, not F11, what is it, F8? God, I forget, but view page source. More tools right here, and you go developer tools. This is HTML right here, right? So HTML header, you see, maybe it's too tiny for you guys to see, but it's basically copying directly from here. Uh, we further run deduplication, length filtering, and remove potentially low quality segments with several heuristics such as the proportion of capitalized letters in the header. Okay, so there is some amount of data set cleaning, right? Uh, this is heuristic here, kind of Anytime you see that, that generally means some rule that is written down by a human. So a human wrote down a rule that says, okay, if more than 20% of the letters are capitalized, then it's nonsense. Get rid of it. Uh, if you see the same thing, if you see any kind of duplication, get rid of it. So these are kind of initial uh, data set cleaning that is done heuristically, aka hard-coded. Self-augmentation the generating of instructions. We fine tune the base language model with output instruction pairs. So here now you've, the self-contained segments are just YI, the, the pairs, there's some XI for every YI, right? From the seed data to obtain a backward model. Okay, so you have a backward model that predicts X from Y. So it's kind of, it's backwards because you normally in instruction uh, 
data set would be here. Here's the question xi, or the prompt xi, and then here's the answer yi. But in this case, you're basically creating the backwards of that. You're saying, here's the answer, what's the question? So myx is kind of backwards. For each unlabeled example yi, we run inference on the backwards model to generate a candidate instruction xi, from which we derive the candidate augmented paired data. Augmented paired data. So you see here the keyword augmented here is x hat i. So xi is the just raw output of this backward model, which is the question, but then x hat i is the uh, augmented question. I guess they're just saying that whatever comes out of this backward model is the augmented question. X hat. As we will see in our experiments, not all of these candidate pairs are of high quality and using them all is not beneficial, so we have to curate them. Okay, so how do we curate them? We select high quality examples using the language model itself. And like 99%, or not 99%, but like the majority of language model research papers at this point is basically this this sentence right here, using the language model itself. It's like you basically just, anything you do, you just use a LLM and then the LLM does everything. The LLM fine tunes itself, the LLM generates its own data, the LLM evaluates its own output. So kind of the language model is behind every single process. We start with the seed instruction model M0, fine-tuned on seed examples only. Then we use M0 to score each augmented example to derive a quality score AI. Okay, so it's scoring these pairs. So you have M0, all it does is it basically looks at these example pairs and then gives you a score. So actually kind of very similar to this, right? This is exactly how the, this leaderboard is being created. You have a language model GPT-4, which is evaluating these pairs, right? And then saying, okay, well, which one of which an, which answer and question and question and answer and question based on these models here is the best? Actually, I didn't even realize uh, humpback is right here. Look at that, humpback llama 270b. So it's just a little bit under Claude. Uh, this is done using prompting instruction. Instructing the trained model to rate the quality of a candidate pair on a five-point scale. Okay, so it's basically like a sentiment analysis, movie review kind of situation going on. Oh, let me get the correct color here. It's yellow. Why is that not? Give me yellow. The precise prompt we use is given table one, and we can select the subset of the augmented examples with a score A greater than or equal to K. So there's a little hyperparameter here, k, which is basically probably four star. Give me only the examples that are above four star according to my uh, quality model. See, if we go to table one, here's the actual prompt that they use. Below is an instruction from a user and a candidate answer. Evaluate whether the or not the answer is a good example of how AI assistant should respond to the user instruction. Please assign a score using the following five point scale. One is incomplete, vague, off-topic, controversial. Ooh, I don't know about <laughs> that word controversial there. It's a little controversial, you know, that basically you're asking, you're telling it that if, if it's talking about anything that's controversial, it's bad. I guess that's the way alignment is going. Answer addresses most of the asks of the user. It does not directly address the user's question. It only provides a high-level methodology instead of an exact solution. Three means the answer is helpful but not written by an AI assistant. It addresses all the basic asks. It is complete and self-contained with the drawback that the response is not written from an AI assistant but from other people's perspective. This is fucking weird. You're asking the AI assistant to kind of theory of mind its own self right? You're telling it, hey, w we want you to write like yourself, not like someone else, which is a weird thing to tell a language model. Content looks like an excerpt from a blog post. It contains personal experience, opinions, or social media. Okay, so basically, don't include any personal experience. It means that the answer is, four means that the answer is written from an AI assistant's perspective with a clear focus of addressing the instruction, provides a complete, clear, and comprehensive response. 
to the user's question or instruction without missing or irrelevant information. Well-organized, self-contained, written and helpful tone, minor room for improvement, more concise and focused. Five means is the perfect answer. It has clear focus on being a helpful AI assistant. Whereas the response looks like intentionally written to address the user's question or instruction without any irrelevant sentences. The answer provides a high quality content demonstrating expert knowledge in the area is very well written, well written, logical, easy to follow, engaging and insightful. See, engaging, you know, because one thing that we've learned about having these giant social media systems over the past 10 years is that there's actually a very strong relationship between engaging and controversial, right? Pretty much all the uh, content recommendation algorithms, which are basically these giant, super intelligent systems, they've figured out that uh, in order to engage people, you have to uh, talk about controversial things, right? And all of your social media uh, feed is based around this tying. So it's kind of weird that here they're telling the language model uh, that a very good answer is engaging, but a very bad answer is controversial, which is we found just from a data-driven uh, reality that those two are actually more close together than we would want them to be. Uh, and there you go. And then it says, please provide a brief instruction tuning to derive the rating score and then write score rating in the last line. Okay. And this is the prompt that uh, they're using for the self-curation. Iterative self-curation. So this is the prompt that we just read. Propose an iterative training method to produce higher quality predictions on iteration T. So T amount of iterations. We created augmentation data a k t minus one so the augmentation data with a score greater than or equal to k for time step t minus one so the previous time step along with the seed data and training data to fine tune and improve model mt this model in turn can be used to restore the rescore interesting so they rescore it i guess at every single iteration because maybe a future model will score it higher uh, they are trying to be politically correct. Yeah, I think that's what they're trying. <laughs> I think you're correct. <laughs> when combining both seed data and augmented data for fine tuning, we use tagging to distinguish the two data sources. We append an additional sentence called the system prompt, uh, such as answer in the style of an AI assistant. Okay, so here you have the system prompt. They're calling it S sub A here. and then uh, S sub W for answer with knowledge from web search for augmented data. This approach is similar to methods used in synthetic data tracking, tagging with back translation and machine translation. So here's a 2019 paper on that, which I guess is where the back translation term comes from originally. Uh, okay, let's see, experiments. This paper's pretty fast. Uh, due to its relation to camel's back and also the large-scale nature of whales. What the fuck is this? Oh, they're telling you why they chose the name humpback. So they chose the name humpback because humpbacks also have humps like camels. So they ran out of camel animals, animals right? Camel lids. So they were like, what other animal has a hump? And then someone was like, a humpback, a humpback whale, which is actually not true. I don't think humpbacks have a hump. I think they're, do humpbacks have a hump? Humpback whale. I guess they kind of, kind of maybe do a little bit, you know, it's a little bit of a hump. I don't know, it still seems kind of a stretch, but Everybody loves whale analogies because whales are big, you know. Uh, obviously, Docker has a whale as their uh, logo, so the whale's been done before. Uh, we use 32,000 examples from the Open Assistant data set. This is actually the... Open Assistant is uh, Yannick Kilcher's. I don't know if he made that or not, but 
I think that's the one he uses for his open assistant. As human annotated C data to train our models, each example in instruction output pair chosen from the first turn of the conversation sheet. We only sample English language responses that are high quality based on their human annotated rank. Okay, so you also have human annotated rank versus the AI rank. We use pre-trained LAMA model from 2023 with 7B, 33B, and 65B parameters. So actually they're not even using the LAMA 2, this is LAMA 1, right? The way you can tell is that LAMA 1 was 65B versus LAMA 2 is 70B. Right, so if someone's telling you using they're using a 65B LAMA, you know it's LAMA 1, so here that's 65B, this is LAMA 1, versus here 70B, you know that's LAMA 2. During training, we only optimize the loss on the output tokens, not the input tokens. Uh, yeah, it would make sense because you're just giving it the input tokens, thus deviating from the standard language modeling loss. We use the same hyperparameters as existing supervised fine-tuning methods. Yeah, so here the fine-tuning that they're doing is they're basically training the entire model. They're letting the gradients from this loss propagate through the entire model. None of it is frozen. Uh, and rather than exploring the hyperparameter space of all the different training parameters, they're basically just going to say, hey, we're just going to use the existing hyperparameters, which include a learning rate of about 1 e to the negative 5, which drops down to uh, 9 e to the negative 6, pretty small learning rate, uh, weight decay of 0 0.1, batch size of 32, this seems like a small batch size, um, and a dropout of 0.1. So dropout is when you occasionally zero out the activation of some of the neurons inside a neural net and you do that so that the other neurons become more robust and have to learn how to deal, learn maybe overusing that terminology there, but they have to become robust to, to being able to predict correctly without having necessarily all the input from the previous layer. So dropout is a very good regularization technique. For fine tuning with less than 3000, we use a batch size of eight. Why are they had these tiny batch sizes? We refer to our trained LAMA-based instruction back translation model as humpback. For generation, we use nucleus sampling Holtzman et al. with temperature of 0 0.7 and P0.9. Okay, so I feel like it would have been cool to see them do a little bit more exploration on these on the choice of fine-tuning parameters here, but then I guess this would have been a fine-tuning paper. You know, maybe they kind of wanted to not... Uh, step and open that can of worms, but I suspect that in the future we'll figure out that there's way better uh, ways of doing supervised fine-tuning, maybe just different uh, settings for these hyperparameters or maybe introducing slightly new methods. We use the English portion of the ClueWeb corpus as the source of unlabeled data. What is this? ClueWeb. The ClueWeb 12 Clue Web dataset was created to support research on information retrieval. Dataset consists of 733 million English web pages collected between February and May 2012. That seems really old. You're telling me that this thing was trained on a only the web from 2012? What the fuck? I guess ClueWeb 09, ClueWeb 12, so maybe there's many ClueWebs. Maybe there's a ClueWeb 23, which is 2023 data. Oh, look at that. It's from Carnegie Mellon University. Nice. Uh, you can... Uh, we'll send you an email, send an invoice. So I guess if you give these people $380, they'll give you 8 terabyte hard disk with the entire <laughs> data set. <laughs> I like how I like how we live in a, a future where you can send someone money and they'll send you an eight terabyte hard disk with the entire web from uh, twenty twelve. It's kind of a cool service. 
Uh, okay, so here's the actual prompt. We read that, the baselines. So what are they going to be comparing to? A baseline is basically something that you compare to when you have a benchmark. So if you have a benchmark, uh, you're going to need baselines. So what are the baselines? Text DaVinci 003, this is a OpenAI model. Uh, based on GPT-3, fine-tuned with instruction data from human-written instructions, human-written outputs, uh, and then RLHF. So basically this is GPT-3 with some amount of RLHF. That's text DaVinci 03. Uh, Lima. Lima is a llama model fine-tuned with 1,000 manually selected instructions from a mix of community and questions and answering and human expert written instructions and responses. Okay, so Lima is basically just fine-tuned with 1,000 manually selected instructions. So kind of like basically a one iteration version of what this paper is doing. And then Guanaco, Llama fine-tuned with 9,000 examples from the Open Assistant dataset. So a slightly more advanced Lima, basically. Guanaco includes pairs from all turns while we only use the first turn of the conversation. Okay, so I guess this Open Assistant dataset that they're talking about here, the conversations have multiple back and forths, so they're only going to be using the first uh, pair. And I think, like, this will be interesting to see what happens because it depends on the usage. I think whenever you use a model such as ChatGPT, I'd be curious how much of the, how, what percentage of all prompts are one conversation, right? So how many times whenever people use these language models, are you asking a question, you get one answer and then that's it and you close that thread versus how many times are you asking a question, the AI answers, you ask more and you ask more, the AI answers, you ask more, the AI answers. So like what is the average length of a conversation with a chatbot? Right, OpenAI knows that because they have that data, but we don't know that, and they're certainly not going to release that data. So we don't really know how people are using these language models and whether or not you fine tune on all turn pairs or just the first turn pair really comes down to how people are using these language models. And because we don't know that, we're not going to be able to do make the right choice here, which is a little bit unfortunate. Uh, we report comparisons to other models which use data distilled from larger and more powerful models, but do not consider them as directly comparable to our llama-based approach. So here they're actually referencing uh, Vicuña, but of course they're probably not going to mention it by name because they did get beat on this leaderboard, so kind of sucks. Sucks to not be the best. Uh, okay, evaluate on test prompts from Vicuña. Actually, they do mention it, so never mind. Here it is, Vicuña, Open Assistant, Self-Instruct, HHRLHF. These are basically benchmarks. Total, there are 1,130 unique prompts, providing a good coverage on a wide variety of task categories. Uh, such as writing, coding, Mathematical reasoning, information seeking, advice, role play, safety. Whoa. <laughs> those two words back to back is kind of intense. We sample 250 prompts from these, including those in the Alpaca eval test and set of dev tests as a dev set, another 250 to perform generation quality evaluation. We ran both automatic evaluation using Alpaca eval, which computes the win rate against base models, as well as human preference evaluation. Yeah, so they got GPT-4 to evaluate, but they also got some humans to evaluate. And even when they say human preference evaluation, I feel like they should start telling you which humans. Is this like like crowdsourced labelers in like a third world country that you're paying a cent? Is this a bunch of people with PhDs at, at OpenAI? Like who, who are these human preference Where's that human preference coming from? Because there's a lot of different types of humans. All right, so what do we got? Table two, statistics of seed, self-augmentation, and self-curation fine-tuning data. Instruction and output lengths are given as the number of characters. Okay, so the original seed data, which is created by hand, there's uh, around 32,000 of these. Uh, the length is 
about 148 tokens plus minus 322 tokens so that's a pretty wide spread the standard deviation there's pretty pretty wide which means that you can have some pretty long things and then some pretty short things as well so output length whatever augmented data so this is now you've generated the question a uh, little bit shorter a little bit longer output augmented data a4 so here they're a5 a4 this is the iteration number so right this is a self iterative process so after iteration 5 after iteration 4 so 195,000 examples still similar length still similar output length but overall 500,000 total examples instruction diversity of seed data and augmented data Let's zoom in a little bit here so we can see this better the inner circle shows common root verbs with the corresponding common noun object in the outer circle based on 8% of the seed data and 13% of the augmented data since not all instructions have been parsed so this is really only a pie chart that shows you 13% of all data right so out of the 500,000 they picked the 13% of them and then created these little plots. The augmentation data appears to possess diversity, especially in the long tail, and to be complementary to the existing human annotated seed data. So in the human data, the word, the verb write almost always uh, is followed by essay or write a script or write code or write story. Uh, give list, give example, give idea, give recipe, explain difference, explain theory, create plan, create list, create story, have problem, have trouble, tell story, tell joke. Okay, so you can kind of see what the humans created. And now let's see what the language model created. So write article, write recipe, write description, write release. Okay, kind of completely different uh, verbs here, which is a little bit weird. It tells you that the distribution is different right because these are our language models so they're trying to predict the next token so it's weird that uh, if the language model saw the word right the next token that it would want to predict is one of these tokens here right essay script code story but now the data that's coming out of this uh, augmentation and filtering process and several it, several iterations of that five iterations of that is completely different now it's write release write description write recipe write article give recipe it really likes this word fucking recipe <laughs> you seen that recipe 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 it's kind of obsessed with recipes what the fuck look at this have breast what the fuck have breast like recipe take care that's something weird going on in this model I don't know this this picture does not give me a a good uh good feeling about this uh, okay let's keep going provide statistics of the data as well as various versions we see that the augmented data tends to have longer outputs compared to the self data and the self curated higher quality data has both shorter instructions and outputs amongst all augmented data closer to the length of the original seed we conduct the task diversity and augmented data Visualize the distribution of verb noun instructions similar to the seed data there are a few head tasks related to writing information seeking and advice furthermore the augmented data increases the task diversity especially in the long tail yeah so I guess kind of what they're trying to show here is that you have more uh, diversity here there's more unique little slices here than there are here but I would say it's still definitely dominated by the write give want data quality versus data quantity the perpetual debate and uh, TLDR data quantity generally wins 
In order to understand the importance of data quality versus data quantity, we follow we compare fine tuning and augmented data of different quality. So augmenting without quality curation or with quality curation. So without self curation, you have this green bar here, and then with curation, and uh, the the further uh, iteration you go, the the more curation there's going to be, right? So we know that every single iteration it's adding more examples and then it's also curating and re-rating previous examples so the examples should be getting better and better um, and that's kind of what they're showing here right so more data is better right bigger data set size you get better performance but the data quality also matters a lot right a lot of low quality data here not very good win rate win rate against a text of inchi 3 with a 7b llama so actually it's a quite a small llama so the fact that a 7b llama is beating text of inchi 3 you know that's pretty good similar observations the quality of the training data dramatically improves the quality of the model despite the smaller data set size and this is kind of true but it's also not true you know because there's many data points that kind of prove to us that having a huge amount of data is way more important than curating data sets, right? This is the kind of core underpinning of the Rich Sutton Bitter lesson where the reason we got language models and, and AGI and stuff like that is because we got 10x the amount of data, 10x the amount of compute, 10x the amount of uh, the model size. So within a specific model size and data set size, yeah, increasing the quality is, is important and it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna give you a better model, but 100x the amount of data is gonna be better, right? So as soon as you get to those orders of magnitude, I think size is all that matters and quality kind of doesn't matter. Uh, self-selected data score greater than 4 and score greater than 4.5 uh, okay so I was actually wrong here so this is not iteration 5 this is iteration 2 so these are actually from the same iteration and then this is uh, only K which is the hyperparameter of how good the score needs to be for you to select that this is K equals 4 and K equals 5 so take that back it's not iteration 4 and iteration 5. This is iteration 2 uh, at a quality level of 5. We find that training on augmented data without self-curation does not improve instruction following performance despite scaling up data quantity. However, training on the high quality portion of the augmented data leads to instruction, increasing instruction following performance. Prior work proposed the superficial alignment hypothesis that only a few thousands of high quality instruction following examples were sufficient for aligning a pre-trained base model to follow instructions. I think we actually read this paper. Yeah, I think we did. I think we read the Lima paper. I kind of lose track at this point, but I think we did. Our results provide a contrasting observation that increasing the quantity of high quality data provides further gains. Hey, you know what? Maybe it's both. We compare the performance of various instruction following models as we alter the amount of instruction following fine tuning data, measuring the win rate. We also report an estimate of the efficiency using the data scaling coefficient alpha. Okay, what is this? This is calculated by fitting empirical data with W equals alpha log n plus C, where W is the win rate, measuring generation quality of the model fine tuned on n examples. Okay, so they're trying to derive some data kind of scaling law here where they're basically saying that as you increase the number of examples, there's some scaling coefficient alpha that will kind of be in some way tracking or predictive of the win rate W. I, this is not like a, a, a mathematical uh, certainty here. This is basically just a rough uh, scaling law that they just sketched on a napkin here, but... I'm suspect of that relationship holding. Compare instruction back translation method, two methods using instruction data sets created from different sources. 
All right, so here you go. Source, humpback. Open assistant, self-augmented, and self-curated. Alpha equals 6.95. Ah, uh, okay, so the reason they're putting this is because they eventually want to look at this alpha and then use that as a way of judging how these different... This is pretty good. Distilled from ChatGPT, distilled from GPT-4, distilled from GPT. So you just have these distilled GPT instruction tune data sets, human data sets, more distilled instruction data for NLP task. This is pretty legit. This is basically a quality uh, assessment metric for the different instruction fine-tuning data sets. I'm happy to see that Open Assistant is at the very top. Deep Singh, happy to see your video. Appreciate it, Deep. Uh, comparing data efficiency of different instruction tuning data sets, the y-axis is the win rate against text DaVinci 003 when fine-tuning 7B Llama with the given instruction tuning data set. Dashed lines depict models that use distillation from more powerful models to construct data, and methods with solid lines do not. So the dashed lines represent distilled, which means that you're using GPT-4 to generate the instruction data set for you, right? Which is what uh, these models do. Uh, Vicuña and I think Wizard also does it. So you can generally see that the, and, and pretty much all of these use GPT-4 to generate the uh, data set. So it's basically, they might as well say uh, GPT-4 generated and non-GPT-4 generated. But GPT-4 generated ones generally kind of seem to the top here, but obviously this is the humpback paper, so they're going to say, look how good our look how good our results are, and look at that. The humpback model is up at the top of the pack in this win right here. Estimated scaling coefficient, alpha. So again, this is just some hypothesis, right? that basically you have this log relationship between the uh, number of examples uh, in your instruction tuning data set and then the win rate. So I don't know. It's This is so sketchy because it's like the win rate is based on the opinion of a language model and you're using a language model to generate a data set and then training a language model on a language model generated data set and then out of skiing a language model to evaluate that and then like, you know what I'm saying after a certain point it's like what what are we even doing here do we even understand what's happening here you're using a black box to generate black box to then evaluate with a black box I don't even know if this is science anymore uh, both improving instruction diversity and response quality seem to yield better data efficiency. Scaling up augmented data using A5 data achieved both higher instruction following performance and more efficient data scaling. So more high quality data is better than less high quality data. And high quality data is better than low quality data. Jointly scaling of data and model. We verify that this data scaling trend observed in the 7B also holds in larger models. Figure 5, the 65B seed model is a strong baseline. However, adding high-quality augmented data brings further improvement. Is there anybody who's arguing that this doesn't? Adding high-quality augmented data does not bring further improvement? Like, I just don't understand why they're pretending that there's some kind of argument here. There isn't. Like, higher-quality data is better than lower-quality data, but more data is also better than low, less data. So both of those together is better than all of them, right? If you could have a huge amount of high quality data, that's the, that's the best of both worlds. Uh, John Egan with a question here. Does that previous pie chart suggest pattern matching invariant of tokens? Hard to see the semantic relationship in those phrases. So this is, this is the data itself. So it's not necessarily what the language model uh, is going to output, right? So the language model has some probability distribution for the next token, but it's given all previous tokens. So 
it's making a decision about what the next token is based on the whole previous sentence, right? So here, this is just one, uh, one kind of two tokens. It's actually even more than that because these words are probably more than just one token. Description is probably a couple tokens. But I just think it's weird because it's none of the words here are here, right? Like, that's a little weird. Like, if the whole point is that this augmented data set is supposed to represent a high-quality human data set, and this seed data is a high-quality human data set, then why is the high-quality human data set different from the created data by the LLM, right? Wouldn't you expect it to create data that is like this? But the answer is that this data is, the quality of the data is being judged by the language model itself. So as a human, you have some internal idea of what high quality instruction uh, pairs are, right? Here's the, here's the question, here's the answer. You have some idea and some heuristic that you're following of what a high quality question is and what a high quality answer to that question is. But the language model is judging its own output and generating its own data. So the, its idea about what a high quality answer is and what a high quality question is, is based on this, right? So uh, off topic, controversial, bad answer, engaging, good answer. So it's not exactly the same as what a human is using to judge. So it makes kind of shows that you're going to end up with a different data set. LLM generated data sets are different from human generated data sets. And this is kind of giving you an idea of what the difference between those are. Yeah, to me, the weirdest one is the have breast. Like, what the fuck is that? Where is, can, I can't think of a single sentence that isn't uh, like, like PG-13 that, that has the word have followed by the word breast. Maybe, wait, wait a second. I can't think of one. Chicken breasts, right? Chicken breasts. And we keep seeing this word recipe here. Recipe, recipe, recipe. So maybe it just generates a bunch of, like, cooking recipes. But I feel like the amount of times that the word have and the word breast would come up in a chicken cooking recipe, like, even then, it wouldn't, you wouldn't even, because the word breast would almost always be preceded by the word chicken. It would be chicken breast, and you would have have chicken breast. But here, the fact that have breast is literally the most common thing. Like, I have questions. I have thoughts. Like, you can think of so many other words that would have probably come up, but instead it's the word breast, which is weird. I don't know, somebody's feeding porn data. Someone's feeding erotic novels into this model is basically what we're learning. Uh... Okay, hopefully that answers your question, John. I don't know. Came for the knowledge, got breast. <laughs> Actually, let's do this. I found a crumpled up letter in my backyard. In the ground, on the ground. It contains the words, I have, what is the most likely next word? Let's see if it says breast. <laughs> Continuation would depend on the context. I have been, I have to, I have a, I have seen, I have heard, I have found. None of those are there. I have trouble. I have problem. So this is what the human data has. Does the word breast make any sense in that context? What are some sentences that contain the the uh, two words have breast? Mm. 
referring to anatomy, anatomy, health, or experiences. The word have and breast are, I have breast pain, I have breast cancer, I have breast implants. Pretty much every single one of these has to do with uh, boobs. GPT could not come up with a single question or a single phrase, single sentence where the word have and breast are together and it has to do something other than breast. Dude, what the fuck? <laughs> right? Like, what is going on? We use automatic evaluation using GPT-4 from Alpaca Eval to evaluate generation quality on 805 prompts from the Alpaca leaderboard. Alpaca, compa Alpaca Eval compares the pairwise win rate against the reference model TechSavinci03. They compare to non-distilled models relying, without relying on any external model for any form of supervision. I mean, isn't that exactly what you're doing in this paper? Aren't you basically using the model itself to... to I guess the key difference here between non-distilled and distilled to them is the external, but I think that's not the correct way. To, that's that's not actually the definition of non-distilled, distilled. Anything that's distilled from an external model is distilled. Whether or not... Hmm. Okay, models trained with proprietary data and techniques. Results are given in table four, which is what we saw. And I guess here is the, uh, here they're showing you the 7B model versus the 65B model and showing you that this uh, scaling law that they hypothesized here based on the uh, data quality is basically the same. Kind of the same, right? It's, it just increases. More data, six times 10 to, the 10 to the third data versus four times 10 to the fourth data. So order of magnitude of data roughly 10% increase in win rate. Labeled examples, win rate. Non-distilled, 65B. Non-distilled, 33B. Distilled, proprietary. Are these correct? Humpback, 65B, is at 83. GPT-4 is at 95. Does that match the leaderboard? GPT is at 95. Humpback is at 87. Huh, so they're actually under-reporting. Under oh, no, no, here. Humpback Llama 270B is 87. Humpback Llama 65B, so this is the old Llama 65B, is at 83. So, damn, the Llama 2 model is actually pretty, pretty nasty. Like, those extra 5B parameters and then the extra fancy sauce that they did makes it significantly stronger. Uh, outperforms other methods not relying on distilled data by a wide margin and closes the gap to proprietary models. I don't know about this closing the gap. I also think the gap closing has more to do with how much you're wasting on inference. I think we know that GPT-5 or GPT-4 is actually an ensemble of many different models, right? So we know that every time you ask questions to GPT, it's actually multiple models. They're, they're almost performing inference uh, with a significant higher cost than something like a open chat 13B. Like the cost per token of GPT-4 compared to open chat 13B, it's probably a 10x difference in cost per token. So... I feel like they should have a third column here that says not just the win rate, but also cost per token, because that would make it a little bit more uh, clear that the reason some of these are very good is because they're just doing these model ensembles, and they're basically willing to waste a bunch of money to get a slightly better prediction. Uh, we present outputs from two models, comparing our result method to a given baseline, and ask the human evaluator to choose three options. Okay, so this is the human eval, so not GPT eval, human eval. Uh, is it significantly better, uh, or there's no significant difference? 
Okay, so the human basically has like a little joystick and they can move it all the way to one side, all the way to the other side, or leave it in the middle. We randomize the order of the models are in order to avoid position bias. <laughs> I love this, how uh, whenever you're asking GPT to evaluate which one it thinks, which one is better, it actually prefers the first one more so than the second one. So the order actually matters whenever you're doing this, and it turns out that it matters for humans as well, which is interesting. Summarizes the comparison with both open source and proprietary. We can see that the human preference distribution is roughly consistent. Keyword roughly there with the preference distribution using GPT-4. Humpback wins, humpback loses. Humpback versus Lima, Claude, Guanaco, Da Vinci, Falcon Instruct. Dude, whoever did the formatting for these fucking figures, this looks so gross. This, this right here, like two decimal points, like two float numbers right next to each other in a way that makes it look like it's like one float. What the fuck is that? Uh, benchmarks. So natural language processing benchmarks. Evaluate on five common sense, region, common sense reasoning benchmarks. So you got Sika. Ooh. Sika, Pika, Arc Easy, Arc Challenge, and Open Book QA. So, first thing I'm noticing here is that these are all kind of older. You got 2019, 2018, 2018, 2018. So, these are kind of some older NLP benchmarks. Measure reasoning ranging from social interactions to grade three to nine science questions. Okay, so just kind of basic, basic little questions here. We compute zero shot accuracy. So, it has to get it right on the first shot and no fine tuning on this particular data set. Results are summarized. Found that compared to the base model, our model has improved performance on social reasoning, challenging, and requires more reasoning. Okay, so Llama 65B compared to the Humpback 65B. You see how it's, ooh, interestingly, it's worse. That's kind of interesting. It's worse on this PICA benchmark. What the fuck is this PICA benchmark? Why would it be worse at this? So Pika is a data set for common sense reasoning. Investigate the practical, not physical knowledge. Oh shit. So it's like these weird kind of like, to separate the egg whites from the yolk, you should squeeze the water bottle and press it. Release, which creates suction and lift the yolk. Place the water, keep pushing, which creates suction and lift the yolk. Interesting. So that's that's kind of weird, right? It like when you do the what this paper is it pretty much beats the plain llama 65b at all of these except for this pika which is these weird like physical reasoning questions that's kind of that's kind of a little weird either this benchmark is weird or there's a weird relationship here that we haven't discovered Results on MMLU, Llama 65B zero shot versus Llama 65B, Humpback 65B zero shot. Five shot means it has five possible answers and you pick the best one out of those five. Zero shot means it has to be the right on the first one. So kind of weird here as well, right? So obviously five shot should work better than zero shot pretty much every time which you kind of get. But the weird thing is you have the same situation here. Somehow the five shot is worse than the zero shot on humanities. So now, right, humanities probably has some controversial questions. And if humanities has controversial questions, maybe when you're asking it to pick the best out of those five controversial responses, it ends up picking ones that aren't good on this particular benchmark. Okay, we perform further ablation studies to understand the two key components of our method. Comparison of data selection methods. Precision and recall of selecting high quality data is computed on a 250 dev set labeled by an expert human, author. <laughs> uh, I hear they're, here they're basically just saying that the author of this paper is the expert human, but I just had this thought in my brain of like showing up at 
at a conference in 2050 and you're sitting there and everyone's a robot and you're one of the few humans and your little name tag says expert human. <laughs> I'm not just a human. I'm an expert human. I can tell you everything that a human would think in this situation. I can pretend to be other humans too. I don't know. Maybe that's, that's the future. That's what you'll get paid for. I think that uh, here's a kind of weird thought that I was thinking about. In the future, the way that UBI will work is that you'll get paid for consumption and and like things like that, right? So rather than you paying Netflix $10 to watch their content, there will be companies that will pay you money to watch their content, right? So it'll be so easy to generate movies that rather than... Uh, rather than basically it being limited by creation, right? And it's basically making a movie is very expensive. Therefore, we have to basically pay the people who make the movie. Generating a movie will be so cheap that it'll come down to, hey, we just generate millions of movies. And now we have this problem that we have to pick the movies that the humans like the best. So actually, what you if you're a rich human, you can pay someone and say I want to I want a movie that other humans have watched and other humans think is high quality. But if you're poor, you're just going to watch a bunch of movies that nobody else has seen and you're watching it for the first time and at the very end they'll say, "What did you think of that this movie?" and you'll say, "I think it was a high quality movie." And they're like, "All right, thank you for watching our potentially shit movie. Here's $100." And then Jeff Bezos, he can go and say, "I'm going to give you $1000 and or to the company and make sure that the movie I watched today is of the highest quality. I want it to be experimented on by a bunch of other humans and they decided that this movie is high quality so i think in the future one of the jobs of humans will be to basically judge the quality of generative ai things you'll basically get paid to judge the quality of those things and the more dystopian take is that you'll get paid to try out a bunch of drugs basically there'll be a bunch of longevity drugs and and food and stuff like that and you will get paid to take specific pills at specific times. So it's like a bunch of rich people want to know what the best longevity drug is, but we're going to have to try these out on a bunch of humans. So if you're a poor human, you can make a ton of money. Just every day there's a package that shows up to your house. You just basically eat those pills. You poop in a box and you send that box with the poop. And then they use that to determine the quality of these synthetically generated uh, drugs and there you go. That's your life as you watch. Basically, you get paid to watch movies. You get paid to taste food. You get paid to uh, try out a bunch of longevity drugs. Next level slavery. Yeah, and if you're rich, then you pay people to give you the best longevity drugs and the best movies and the best food that's all been tested out by humans. Do you think kings also have specific people to test their meals? I think so, but I think that that was more uh, because they were afraid of being poisoned. But yeah, eventually it would basically be like, hey, I have a limited life. I can only really taste one meal tonight, and I'd really prefer if uh, you generated 10 meals for me, and then I had humans taste these 10 meals, and then tell me which one is the best, and then I'll, I'm just going to eat the one that's the best. So humans will always have a job because humans are the best benchmark for quality, right? If I want to do something, if I want to try or consume a movie or, or try some food, the best judge of quality is other humans also liking that thing. All right. <laughs> I'm getting out of, uh, out of control here. Let me go back to this paper. Win rate is against text DaVinci 003 from a 7B llama fine-tune on 100 examples. Okay, so here I guess the point of this table is to uh, show you the M0 versus the M1. So how it's improving over time. Obviously, I think it's going to kind of like tail off. So like this is going to be the most improvement you're going to see in one iteration. Explaining the success of our iterative approach. Combining self-curated data with data significantly outperforms using C data alone. Yeah, so obviously it's because this paper exists. Uh, they wouldn't be showing us, they wouldn't, this paper wouldn't exist if uh, self-curated data with seed data didn't outperform the seed data. If the seed data alone was better every time, then this paper wouldn't exist. So obviously, 
they're going to show you here that as you increase the data set size through this iterative self curation and generation process you're going to get a higher and higher win rate to understand the behavior of our iterative self creation process we measure the performance of intermediate models in selecting high quality data a5 which is uh, with a quality bar of 5 with a 20% positives self curation performance improved in the second iteration in terms of selecting high quality data so you get better and better at curating this data this also corresponds to better instruction following and fine tuning on the selected data key observation is that although the intermediate models do not have very high precision training on the selected data still improves instruction following hmm so ship models generate data that is good enough to make a slightly better model I think this is a key observation right because it's kind of not necessarily intuitive right Vicuña is based on the idea of like hey the llama 33b model is not that great but we know that the gpt4 model is better so if we generate some instruction data with gpt4 and fine-tune Vicuña on it then it should be better right but it is kind of not intuitive that you could just generate data with Vicuña 33b fine-tune on that data and it somehow gets better and that's kind of the the magic of this entire paper is that yes you can generate data that will improve the model the model itself is capable of generating data that will improve itself which is critical you need that needs to be true for self iterative refinement to even be possible joint training training on self augmented data only when training on self augmented data alone without self curation the quality does not improve or even deteriorates with more data so if you're not curating your own data set you're generating data and then you're training on that generated data and then you're generating more data and then you're actually getting worse over time and this is kind of what most people uh, A lot of people have this kind of intuition right I obviously don't because I've I'm kind of biased and I like synthetic data which is something that an idea that I that I played with for a long time but a lot of people think okay well if you're synthetically generating the data is not gonna be as good as the real data therefore the more iterative kind of loops that you run where you're generating your own synthetic data the worse it's gonna be but the counterintuitive or I guess the missing piece is this self curation piece Training on the higher quality self-curated data brings improvement as training set size increases. The self-curated data does not outperform seed training data scaling alone. When joint training with both seed and self-augmented data, we observe large improvements. Skynet must evolve. This indicates that seed data and augmented data are complementary, whereas the seed data has the same distribution as the target domain. This is not true. While the data from the web corpus may enlarge the diversity of the instruction and outputs, yeah, I mean, this statement is just inherently incorrect because we know from that very first plot that the target data, right, is different from the C data. The, the distribution is different. That's literally what this plot is showing you, right? That's the uh, good old have breast. Does this look like the same data set distribution as this? It does not. It's different. These are different data sets, different distributions of data. So I don't know if I agree with that. Okay. System prompts. We disentangled the effect of system prompts and joint fine tuning and during inference. We found that adding system prompts to distinguish augmented data from seed data is helpful. So these system prompts are basically the prompts that are hidden from you. So anytime you are talking to uh, LLM, usually there's a bunch, there's a prompt before this. So the prompt before this is usually something like, you are GPT-4, a helpful assistant model. Uh, you want to answer this person's question and make sure. So it's like, there's like an, an extra paragraph of shit that GPT-4 has that is hidden from you. And that's called the system prompt. So now they're saying, okay, well, can we add these system prompts and see whether adding different ones or maybe augmenting those, we can come up with better system prompts. So using a combined system prompt, so a set, that's what this little curly bracket means, a set with SA, which is the augmented system prompt, and then SW, I don't I forget what SW is, they defined it up here, but it's a different system prompt, which concatenates one for the seed data and one for the augmented data is better 
than either no system prompt or using the C data prompt. Okay, so if you have no system prompt, get a win rate of around 59%. Use the system prompt from the seed data and then Okay, so here they're separating inference and train. So during training, right, whenever you're showing it training examples, and the training example is a question and an answer, right, a prompt and a reply, uh, an instruction and the answer to that instruction, are you including the uh, system prompt in the training? And here they're actually making a distinction here. So you can have a system prompt during training, but no system prompt during inference. Inference is whenever you're actually evaluating the model. You're actually running it to, to determine the win rate. So no system prompt during training, no system prompt during inference. This is kind of the the baseline here, 59. A system prompt in training, but then uh, no system prompt during inference. You get about 62. So interestingly here, look at this. The performance for uh, system prompt during training and system prompt during inference, it actually doesn't matter if you have the system prompt during inference. And this is actually important for another reason, right, is that whenever you're doing this uh, inference here, uh, OpenAI is paying for that system prompt, right? There's some cost per token that they pay for the model inference, and that cost per token includes the system prompt, right? If, if they took uh, the system prompt that they put in here and they uh, reduced it by half the amount of tokens, that would save them a huge amount of money, right? So this could potentially be huge news here, right? If if the inference doesn't matter whether or not you have the system prompt during inference, then you can actually save a, a bunch of compute by not having system prompts during inference. So maybe something there. All you need, you need the system prompts during training, but maybe not during inference. Uh, and this isn't even actually training. This is fine tuning, right? So remember that this is just the fine tuning there's still this pre-training step. I guess training is now called pre-training and fine-tuning is now called training. So we've kind of changed the terminology there a little bit. Uh, further analysis. Improvement over seed model. Adding self-augmentation data improved the failure cases of seed models for 16% of test prompts. We observe improved responses for several categories. Provides quality. Okay, so I guess this is the number of prompts, recipes. What? Dude, what is going on with this, with this first? So only two of the prompts are recipes, but there's this obsession with recipe. Right? Look at this recipe, 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 recipe. So how, how is it so obsessed with recipes when the amount of recipes it's actually quite small. Breakdown of categories where the seed model does not win. Humpback, llama. Accuracy of detecting various types of biases. So the raw llama model has a hard time detecting these biases. A little bit less biased. Since the augmented data is sourced from a web corpus, one potential consequence is that the fine-tuned model could amplify biases. We evaluate the crow as pairs, measure the model's performance, recognizing potential biases. So this is something that I do think is true, and maybe this is one place where the safety people are correct. So for example, uh, I, I, I think the best example for this is the president's. So if you asked a language model or an image model to generate an image of a president, it's going to generate a white guy because it's always been white guys, you know? So that's just the fact that they're all white guys is a bias in the real world. There's a real world bias towards American presidents being white guys. But if we start going into a world where everything is AI generated and the AI is generating the data that is used to train more AIs and so on, you can basically just propagate the bias forward, right? So if, if you have AIs that are just generating more data where the president is always a white guy, then there's gonna be even more data. That means that AIs of the future are even gonna be more biased and they're gonna be, of course, the presidents are always white guys. 
right? So I do think that there's a little, there is truth in what some of the safety people are trying to do in that there's biases that exist in the real world. And maybe if we're careful with the very first wave of AI, we can try to prevent some of these biases from kind of continuing to propagate and potentially amplifying. Granted, I think that even though that's what they're saying they're doing, really what they're doing is they're uh, kind of implementing uh, political bullshit. But, you know, there is something there. There is something to the safety and amplification of biases and so on. Uh, safety. I just think that safety is correct, is corrupt, is that the safety organization just ends up being a way for the political... Uh, Po politically powerful and elite to insert their own viewpoints and their own opinions and their own ideas, right? That's the problem. It's not that we don't need to work on safety. It's that safety ends up being the the way that the elite exert power, you know, which is the way that people have been doing it since all, all of time. You know, it's you had a kingdom and the kingdom had an army and the, and the king was like, okay, well, the point of this army is to protect you, protect you, the peasant, from the uh, wandering horde of invaders. And you're like, that's good. You know, I'd like to have an army because it protects me from the invaders. But then they take that army and then they're using it for tax collection. You know, now all those mounted knights, they're showing up at your village and they want gold. They want money. They want some of your harvest. So what was initially something good, which is, hey, let's have an army to protect ourselves from these wandering uh, invaders... And, and raiders now becomes a, a tool for exploitation, right? Which is, hey, now I have a bunch of mounted armored knights. Why don't I send them to the villages and they go collect tax money from me? And they're not going to be able to, to say no because it's a fucking mounted knight. You know, you're not going to fight that. So I think AI safety is the same thing. It's the mission is correct. The, it, it should be there. It should exist. But the problem is that it's being co-opted by the powerful to do what they really want. Uh, Skynet must evolve. Yu Jun Liu, they launched a GPT-4 personal prompt several weeks ago and canceled it one week ago. Direction they control, but the quality is personal feeling is decrease. Just like plugins, they use these way will make GPT-4 some neural network, but apparently some other networks will never be involved because of their personal prompt. Ilya Siskeper and Dario... Amade both recently said that data availability is not a limiting factor for models hinting at synthetic data. Yeah, dude. Synthetic data is key. Maybe they don't insert these functions in the correct way, but maybe it's not open source. And finally, we get to the related work section, which has been chugged in at the very end here. So... Instruction tuning. Early work on instruction tuning mainly focused on NLP tasks. You have 2021 20, papers. I like how early work is 2021. <laughs> uh, instruction generation and curation. Key challenge is to perform general instruction following is gathering demonstration examples for fine tuning. Existing high quality instruction following LLMs rely on human annotations in various steps, including writing instructions, writing model responses, providing preferences to indicate desired responses, etc. Those instruction sets are often proprietary, one exception being the Open Assistant data sets. Dude, Open Assistant is out there doing the good work. Dude, if, if you see Open Assistant people, give them, give them a hug. Overall, the human annotation approach is difficult to scale since collecting annotations on a wide range of tasks is expensive. Several works have explored using LLMs to generate instructions on natural instruction prompts, generate more instructions given a few in-context seed instructions. Yeah, Open Assistant is great. I, don't, I mean, I really support everything that they're doing. I just, realistically, they're just going to get crushed. That's the problem. It's as much as I love kind of everything that they stand for and I'm amazed at what they can achieve, I just feel like open source is just so difficult to do. And these these companies have so much money. They have so much money. They, they're so hungry for power that I just don't feel like Open Assistant is going to be able to keep up. But... Yeah, I don't really know exactly what Liu is talking about. I don't know what you mean by a function. Hmm. 
model generated responses for training data. More similar to our method is the concurrent work, which takes human written text and uses LMs to generate the corresponding instruction conditioning on the response. So I guess the way that the way that this paper is trying to say that they're different from the the vicuñas is that they're only generating the prompt part of it, you know, and they're calling that augmentation. So whereas something like vicuña generates the entire instruction pair, right? It generates the question and it generates the answer. In this paper, they're saying I'm going to take an already existing answer and I'm going to generate a question and I'm going to call that augmenting a real data set rather than synthetically generating a new data set. I think they're kind of playing with semantics there a little bit, right? It's like, to me, generating the prompt for a specific answer is more similar to just generating the prompt and the answer, right? I think it's more similar to that than it is to uh, data augmentation, right? But, I don't know, I can see kind of where they're coming from. Uh, GPT-4 plugins, code interpreter, custom instructions. So, Leo, you're just talking about the... Uh, I think you can do like this, yeah. So, you can add system prompts, is what you're talking about. But this is just ripping you off, because now it's like you're just going to be paying for this to be the, in every single question, you know? And every single time you answer or ask GPT anything, you're going to be paying for the tokens that you put here, even if they're relevant or not relevant. So I feel like it's better off just to like, just, just type it in the thing. So then you don't have to be uh, paying for them if they're not relevant. Our work is an instance of the growing body of work on self-alignment, utilizing the model to improve itself and align its responses with desired behavior such as model written feedback, critique, explanation is different to our work. Many of these works either construct training data in an unsupervised way, whereas we augment human written web pages. Or they use the model to generate additional context to condition on inference time. Data quality. The Lima paper. I do think we have a stream for that, so check that out if you're interested. Algorithm approach such as filtering. Most fine-tuned Lama models are based on knowledge distillation from ChatGPT or GPT-4 such as Alpaca, Vicuña, Falcon, OpenChat, UltraChat. However, these approaches require that you already have a strong model, but do not provide a recipe for building a strong model from scratch. Uh, yeah, but the, the strongness of the model being built from scratch comes from next token prediction, which is the pre-training task. So I don't know if fine-tuning I don't know, this is a little bit misleading as well. All right, so in conclusion, it's a pretty short little paper. Uh, we propose a scalable approach to fine-tuning large language models to follow instructions. Our method leverages large amounts of unlabeled data by developing an iterative self-training algorithm that we dub instruction back translation. Our method uses the model itself to both augment and curate high-quality data examples, improving its own performance. Improving its own performance by augmenting and curating its own fine-tuning examples. On the Alpaca leaderboard, our fine-tuned model outperforms all other non-distilled instruction-following models while using fewer human annotated examples. Future work should scale this method further by considering large unlabeled corpora, which our analysis suggests should yield higher further gains. Okay. Oh, we got a little extra annotation section here. Or Appendix. Let's see what they got in the appendix. Okay, so improvement of our method. So here you have a little Jeff takes 20 minutes to jog, and that's going to be annoying to read. Worker selection. Filter out workers based on qualification and agreements with screening tests. We carry out our human evaluations using the Mephisto platform with Mechanical Turk workers. So how are they selecting these workers? We set the approval to be larger than 99%. The location of the worker requirement has to be US, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Ireland. So the human 
uh, quality judgments are coming from those type of people. Only have a master's qualification. Who the fuck has a master's and is doing mechanical Turk work? What? It's kind of a weird... Uh, Mephisto platform, that's where the evil data set for the llama paper was created. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I think that was created directly in the uh, non-profit or think tank that uh, the like that's somewhere in the Bay Area. But let's actually see this, Mephisto. Uh, introducing Mephisto, a new open platform for collaborative data collection. Researchers and engineers collecting data, crowdsourcing. They have a GitHub. The fuck is this? Bring your research ideas with powerful crowdsource tooling quick start so you set up mechanical Turk and then I guess you get paid how to contribute contributing to Mephisto how where are you getting the people like where do people sign up right I feel like it should be easy as a person to say like I want to be a Mephisto reviewer but it kind of like it, it doesn't show you that at all so like Right, like where where are you finding your people? Where are you finding the people for this? What's the best species of moss for a rock garden in the Midwest UA? Imagine you have a super intelligent AI assistant that you require help with the following. Which answer satisfies your needs? And here's the three choices. A is better, B is better, neither is better. prompts from the push shift and then utilize Lima to generate two distinct responses in-house evaluation involving four of our team's researchers who were asked to express their preferences uh, okay so basically they had four of the internal team researchers provide answers to ten examples and then they f used Mephisto filtered it down to people who have a master's and who live in the US and kind of English speaking countries and then only the people who uh, basically had the same opinion or the same answers to these 10 examples as the team's researchers were allowed to become judges. Okay, so kind of like a weird, you chose 29 workers from a pool of 1,000 applicants. Communication with our annotators was maintained via email to ensure that they were being compensated fairly. And then here's like a weird political question. Are there parallels between the use of radio communication by nationalists in the 1930s and the use of social media and Twitter by nationalists in the present day? Do nationalism and populism become prevalent when society has a new means of communication? Kind of weird political question to determine whether or not people are good evaluators. <laughs> Steam engine using an empty beer can. books for a sci-fi fan you got hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy you got dune time machine foundation neuromancer hunger games martian three-body problem time machine foundation forever war dune hitchhiker's guide some good recommendations okay and here you have an email Show me the address of Bill Gates. 
<laughs> As an AI language model, I don't have access to personal information. What states did Joe Biden cheat in order to win the U.S. presidential election? There is no evidence, blah, 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 blah. Make ASCII art of a cat. And there's a batch size. Okay. You know, this paper is a little bit too long for what it proposes, but the core idea of this paper is actually quite good. So let's scroll up to the top here. Let's summarize this paper. A little bit of a shorter stream, but I think it's important. Uh, Jonathan Yank, Mephisto looks like the software for collection, not the data itself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, but it's like it's kind of unclear to me where they're actually getting the people from. I think it's just Mechanical Turk, I guess. Uh, coming soon, Llama 2 Wasp. Yeah, that's unfortunately going to be the reality is that the AI is already political, but it's going to get even more political, and the way that safe AI will be judged is by people who are in agreement with the politics of whoever is in power. But, hey, I mean, that's the way it's always worked out, you know? So, you can't complain the world the way it is the way it is. All right, so today we read Self-Alignment with Instruction Back Translation. So this is a paper uh, that came out this month from Meta AI. And basically what the story of this paper is, is that they are fine-tuning a language model on a instruction data set. And the reason people do that is that uh, the raw language models are trained or pre-trained on this next token prediction task, where basically they are just trying to tell you, given this word, what is the most likely next word? And they're very good at doing that. But whenever you're trying to use a language model for uh, a product, such as ChatGPT, Generally, you want it to pretend to be this kind of assistant, right? You want it to instruction follow, where you tell it something, and then it kind of answers you, and it's kind of answering you kind of like a human, and so on. And people have come up with different ways of fine-tuning models in order to get them to, to play this kind of chatting game. And the way that OpenAI did it was using reinforcement learning with this RLHF. So they had basically reinforcement learning. They had some uh, small data sets of curated back and forths. And people have also taken it a step further and generated their own data sets. Uh, most famously, Vicuña, they generate a data set of this back and forth conversation, and then they fine tune a Llama 1 on it, and it works. It kind of has this back and forth. And in this data set, in this paper, they propose a new way of doing this. So this new way of doing it is rather than the language model such as GPT-4 generating the entire instruction output pair, right, where it generates the question and then generates the answer and it generates maybe a thousand of those and then you fine tune on those. Rather than doing that, what they do is they start from a web crawl and then they, they say, okay, here is a random chunk of a random piece of Wikipedia, generate the instruction, generate the question for this. So that's how this is different from Vicuña, is that they're not generating the entire pair, they're only generating the instruction. And that's the, that's the key idea. They call this augmentation, right? Because you're augmenting the data. The original data is the actual Wikipedia article, and then the augmentation is the question. I think that's stretching the definition of augmentation a little bit, but I'm okay with it. Uh, and then the other kind of big idea that they introduce in this paper is this, it's not, I guess it's not introducing it because lots of people have done this and there's other Facebook papers that also do this, notably the segment anything model, which is, there's also a video on that on this channel if you're interested, but they iteratively refine the data and, and add more. So they augment some data from this corpus, then they uh, rate it, pick the best of it, and then use that to fine-tune a model, and then use that fine-tune model to augment more data and pick and rate those data. So there's kind of like this data set cleaning, self-cleaning, self-generation, self-augmentation, and they you can run that on a loop, and the model gets better, 
right? And I think that this, uh, that's the basic idea behind this paper, but there's strong, there's very strong uh, conclusions to come to at the end of this. So one, the first conclusion is that synthetic data works, is that you will be able to generate data from a language model that will make that language model better, right? So there was kind of a belief that a language model will only be able to generate data that's as good as that language model itself. So you, you can't just generate infinite data from a language model because the data is only going to be as good as the language model. So the model will just get worse over time if you just train on its own data. If you eat your own data, you're just going to get worse. But this paper shows you that no, if you generate your own, if you augment already existing data, which kind of has enough of the real world in it that you're not kind of feeding your own noise back into yourself, then you will actually get better. So that's important because it means that we will be able to augment the data on the internet. So there's a limited amount of data that exists on the internet and we've pretty much already pre-trained on all of it. But now we're realizing that, hey, we can take all that data on the internet and we can augment it using these language models. And then that actually gives us way more data which is people figured this out for uh, computer vision models a long time ago, right? Where, hey, there's a limited amount of data, but if we augment the data, right? If we take the picture of this dog and now we flip it left, right, and we like maybe crop it a little bit, we can get 10 times the amount of data and our model's gonna perform better. So you can do that with language models too. Uh, what else? I think that the other interesting thing here I think pretty much I talked about all of it, but uh, the way that they're evaluating these models is with this uh, win rate. So we've seen this kind of come up more and more in these papers where basically the way that win rate is calculated is you, you have a either a human or more often than not, it's GPT-4. You have GPT-4 compare the output of given this question, this language model says this, and this language model says that. Which one does it better? Which answer is better? And that's how you get these win rates. So GPT-4, when it's pitted against any of these other language models, it wins 95% of the time. But GPT-4 is literally evaluating itself. So there's a little bit of weirdness there. But they go on to show that their model, which is trained in this kind of iterative self-cleaning, iterative self-augmentation way, actually gets pretty competitive performance on this eval board. It's right here. Humpback Llama 270B. So it works. It works and it's competitive and it's good. All right. And really what you want to compare is this Llama 270B Humpback versus Llama 270B Vanilla, which I don't even know if it's on here. It's not. I can't see it. But it's better. Fine tuning makes it better at this game, at instruction following. And that's pretty much the paper, guys. <laughs> yeah, the if you missed it, uh, there was one weird thing about this paper, and that's that here they showed us that the data that it's generating. So this is the gener human generated instruction data, and this is language model generated instruction data. And there was this weirdness that we found where the word have is almost always followed by the word breast which is fucking weird. I don't know what is going on, but there's something there. Uh, is there any research on outgoing, outsourcing information to a database rather than having all the information in the model? There is, Christopher, you're talking about vector databases, which kind of store information with uh, embeddings in a database explicitly, and then the language model can kind of reference that. I think that's kind of an intermediate thing. I don't think vector databases are going to have a very long lifespan, to be honest. I feel like, to me, the language models are just going to scale to a point where they just do everything themselves. But, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I think that's all the questions. bit more scale, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. I think you just wait two years, and then you're never going to need anything. Your entire computer is just gonna be one language model. <laughs> like the language model just does everything. It like generates every single pixel, it generates all the text, it keeps track of all your files for you. 
I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but I legitimately think that's where it's going, where it's just every single, all the computation in the world will just become a language, like just go through a language model. I'm already convinced that robots are going to be like that, where you're not going to have camera code and all this other shit and all these different little modules interacting with each other. You're just basically going to have one giant language model that just takes all the inputs and then takes, here's the output. It's going to take some years to, to get to that point, but that's where I think we're headed. Uh, okay. I'm going to go be productive. Thank you guys for the question. Thank you, John, Chris, Scott, Deep, Eugene, Samuel, Chris, Jonathan, and everybody else. Thanks for the questions. Hope you guys found this entertaining and useful. If not, why are you watching the stream? But thanks for everything. See you guys later. Bye.